Build the tools for effective advocacy with ACEC's new online course, Effective Government Engagement at the Local, State, and Federal Levels. Learn from active practitioners in the fields of advocacy, communications, and lobbying on how you can create change and stand out in today's hectic policy environment. Register today for this five-session online course beginning March 2nd. Learn more by visiting our website at acec.org. Welcome to another edition of Engineering Influence, a podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies. Uh, Last month, the ACEC Research Institute held uh, its most recent event in its ongoing Future of Engineering Roundtable series, this time on building density in the post-COVID economy. And the roundtable uh, featured a number of experts in design and uh, building development, and we are pleased to welcome one of those experts to the show. Uh, Sabrina Kanner is the Executive Vice President of Development, Design, and Construction for Brookfield Properties. And uh, Brookfield Properties is is extremely well known, but for those uh, unaware, is a fully integrated global real estate services company. And they're a leader in the development and management of premier real estate with a focus on maximizing the tenant experience in addition to the investment and operational performance of their assets. Uh, and uh, Sabrina is a perfect uh, expert to have on the show to talk about the issue of building density in um, this changing landscape that we're kind of living through with COVID-19 and, and the number of questions that are being, um, are just being risen up to, to the surface that, that really haven't been addressed beforehand uh, about safety, about density, about um, uh, you know, of course, just how many, how are people going to approach office space in the future? How, how, are, how are people going to be looking at designing office space? And, and Sabrina, thank you very much for being part of the show today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, um, you know, what, what was your big takeaway from the roundtable that you participated in with, with the Institute? Um, I think that, um, The big takeaway for me, and and it came in bits and pieces from various perspectives, was that in the future, we'll all be viewing office as an amenity. Mm -hmm. You know, a year ago, we all assumed we needed our place in the office, and this past year has taught us that um, we can definitely function outside of the office, um, and it raises so many questions. Do we always need to be in the in the office? When we are in the office, why are we in the office? Um, and and I forget which one of my colleagues coined the phrase, but um, but I like it very much. And the idea is that you come into the office when you need that sort of creative collision with other people, when you really need that contact, um, because we do miss that 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 integral part of our culture and what makes each company its own personality. Um, So, but the idea that it's a treat to come into the office Um, and clearly necessary, but also clearly maybe not necessary all all the time. So, um, you know, clearly raises questions also about how we work, how we work together, what becomes important in the office, um, what is safe in the office. Um, so I, I, that was my, my aha moment in yeah. our, in our round table. Given the fact that, you, you know, that's a really interesting point that you raised that it's a, you know, you're turning almost the office into, uh, you know, a, a, an attraction to an extent that something that something that someone wants to go into, maybe not all the time now, but you know, it gives them a reason to go in. And that brings the question of, of investments in, in alternative properties from what you've looked at in the past and what you've invested on in the past. Do you think that the shift to more of the office as an attraction, as a, as, as a, as a like you said, a treat to come into, um, is, is going to change the kind of properties that you know, Brookfield as, as a developer is looking to invest in or, or that you can see, you know, institutional clients 
signing leases for? I don't think it makes a difference in, in the properties that we invest in um, or the properties that institutional tenants will continue to sign leases for. I think we make some enhancements, we make some adjustments um, and maybe lean in to some of the efforts we've been making up until the pandemic um, for other reasons, for usually for health and wellness. Mm -hmm. um, but some of the examples uh, I can give you, every one of our buildings is being retrofitted for uh, additional filtration and wherever possible additional ventilation. So the ability to, uh, to increase or continue outside air when, when otherwise we would not have introduced that much outside air. Mm -hmm. um, we had been looking at this uh, again for health and wellness reasons, but um, there's always a trade-off in terms of energy efficiency, which is front of mind for everybody for the last five years, 10 years. Um, so that introduces a, another facet here and we need improved controls, we need smart technology so that we can with precision understand how many people are in our building at a time and right size the amount of fresh air mm -hmm. so that we are optimizing health and wellness goals and um, at the same time managing our energy usage. Um, I, I would also point to placemaking, something that um, I, I, we've been talking about for a very long time, um, but really a, a hot topic in real estate. And that's the introduction in part of um, outdoor space and mm -hmm. the ability for a worker to leave the office, walk around outside, um, maybe bring a laptop, maybe grab a cup of coffee, but an alternative to the sitting at your desk. So um, I, I I think all of these um, are, are important facets of real estate that we are not only um, continuing to pursue, but really embracing at this point. And that, that brings in from our side of the world, from the design uh, side, you know, the importance of working with um, the end client, not just on new buildings that are being designed now, but helping developers figure out what are the best ways to design or augment buildings that are already being used to increase airflow, to deal with those more, you know, like you said, the smart technologies that allow a greater degree of, um, of security from a healthcare standpoint. Um, and then also, you know, using space um, outside of the office uh, to get people uh, more spaced out, maybe a little bit more socially distant and, and at least have that feeling of freedom where you can still work, but you don't have to be kind of cornered in on a, in, in an office or, or a cubicle. How, how have the conversations been going with your design partners in approaching these, these new challenges? Yeah. I, I mean, everyone immediately who has a design bent began thinking about this last March, right? Um, and I think as we've progressed through the pandemic, our thinking about all of this has evolved. So, you know, initially people were afraid to be in an office um, and we've got multiple examples, our, ourselves included, um, where we've been operating really at full capacity for months without a single transmission within the office. So, um, a lot of that comes from really simple things in mm -hmm. some cases, um, temperature scanning as you walk into the building. It's not 100% effective, but it certainly grabs the, the low hanging fruit, if you will. Um, and then plenty of graphics to help people space themselves out, uh, not overload a conference room, understand what is a safe occupancy in, from one space to the next. Um, so uh, those are, are super simple things that designers immediately grasp. Um, as we look to long-term development, some of the adjustments that we're making are, for instance, an alcove in, in a lobby. 
so that if we do revert to temperature scanning, we can uh, do that without rearranging a, a lobby or having to accommodate a pop-up tent within the lobby. Um, and there are several technologies that are available now too that uh, race to market. So as you're walking through your turnstile, understanding who, who has a fever, who doesn't, and where they should be going. Um, so these are all things that people have been talking about. I think we moved fairly quickly off of how do you space people um, because that's pretty simple. Mm -hmm. I think the, the aerodynamics are, are very interesting um, and we continue to study them and many shops are continuing to study those, model those and, and we learn from them. Um, but I, I think technology is probably um, where we see the biggest difference. Yeah, and, and actually when you're when you mentioning a couple of those items, a, a question popped in my mind, which is, you know, a lot of buildings, not, not all buildings, of course, um, have the same level of security as some of your uh, larger or more landmark buildings where you do have those turnstiles or, or security areas at the, at the, right in the lobby um, where you, you would have to either show a credential and get passed through or what have you. Have you, have you noticed a, a trend towards putting more of the screening at the entry of the building than the individual corporate lobby on, on individual floors? Uh, that really depends on, on the property. Um, yeah. We have a, you know, a few properties where buildings are really interconnected. Um, for instance, our Brookfield Place in downtown lower Manhattan. Um, everything is really interconnected, all woven around the winter garden. So you leave a building, enter a building, you never go outside. Um, and so sort of changes the definition of front door, if you will. Um, but I think even prior to pandemic, we were focusing on a level of screening right at the turnstile um, and trying to improve that and even migrate that to our visitor systems. So I think it's a natural to also um, take that and add a health screening if that's something that's wanted. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, it makes a lot of sense, frankly. Um, first of all, it prevents people from queuing in front of a desk, and queuing is not a great thing. Uh, it's something that we're, we're moving past. But, but it's also just um, really good real estate practice. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and that is the lens we try to look at some of these interventions through is um, you know, is whatever we're looking at now, is it really good for the real estate? Is it really good for the value to our tenants? And if it is, um, we move forward. If it's not, it, it's kind of hokey. It's a trick. So, so we don't. Um, and I, I would say too, some of this is important. For instance, the screening at, um, at the lobby, especially at, at the turnstile point is um, it's important because it's very visible mm -hmm. and some of this at the moment um, is is a confidence game right we yeah. need people to have confidence to return to their offices and uh, so to the extent that we can demonstrate what we're doing and it's very visible um, I, I do think that 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 a level of appreciation is there on the part of of both tenants and visitors. And I, and I would imagine, I mean, a lot of this was already ongoing. I mean, I remember working in lower Manhattan right after, immediately after 9-11. I mean, it's, it, and, and watching and showing how, you know, seeing how things change. It, it is a confidence game. It's it's both, you have your show of for, force, for, within it's physical security, securing the building from internal and external threat, physical threat. And, and then you have the more, not not as evident security systems that are put in that work, but you don't really notice them. Um, and I imagine that this is just an, an extension of the work that's already been done by Brookfield and other, um, you know, large developers to just continually improve the security and the safety of their buildings. Um, and and that point you raise is 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 well put that 
you know, having that screening at the turnstile at the lobby, you know, you know, you can see it. It gives you a sense of confidence going in that it's going to be a secure building going, uh, you know, visiting or going to work each day. And then it's it's spacing out those newer smart technologies throughout the building so that you maintain that confidence, but it might not be seen. And there's great opportunity in the, in, in, in the engineering sector to, to make those systems work and, and retrofit existing properties to uh, accept those systems. I, where do you see the demand for that technology going? I mean, I would imagine it's, it's kind of just starting and, and, and is going to just increase over time. Yeah, um, exactly, Jeff. I, I think um, for us, what we're doing is enabling turnstiles and then having individual discussions with tenants. Some tenants welcome this and other tenants feel it's intrusive. So you also have to be sensitive to the individual company's cultures as well. Um, but it, it's very much um, part of our thinking in all AAA development. Mm -hmm. So um, just making sure we're enabled and that we can in fact put that into practice immediately if needed. And you mentioned uh, socially distancing people within offices is a fairly, that was, that was an easy task. You could figure that out. Um, but I guess the question is also on office space in general. Because that movement that was which catching fire um, started, of course, in Silicon Valley and kind of moved throughout all sectors of the economy to have these very wide open space, open office plans um, where you broke down the walls and you just really everybody was communal. You, do you see it being a question of less space or do you think it's just more of a kind of what you mentioned, smart use of space, possibly modular use of space moving forward? You know, I think probably what we're going to see is some flexing of space. Mm -hmm. So could be an office, there have been a couple of tenants who have actually asked for more space because they want to spread people out. Some tenants have asked for less space, but an adjacent space where they could kind of have a a pressure valve where if they need to expand into for two or three months, a small amount of space and then retract. Um, and so we have and had undertaken this frankly before the pandemic, but are, are now, <clears throat> pardon me, seeing a great demand for it. And a lot of people reaching out and saying, okay, how do help me figure this out? You as a landlord, help me figure this out. So, um, so offering those flexible accommodations so that people can think about how they want to use space and how much time will people be in the office. Uh, largely, we're seeing people planning for a return to office. Um, and, and most of them, frankly, around Labor Day, if they haven't mm -hmm. come back already. Um, so the anticipation of vaccination. Um, and then I think it's a wait and see, you know, to the extent to which they allow their employees to work outside um, and to and what extent they expect them to be in. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a sort of a push and pull on the same idea that I mentioned before is office of amenity, office as amenity, but um, have also heard from a number of, of large tenants, global tenants, who are saying, okay, we want to get back to the office. We're, we're not quite firing on all cylinders the way we did when we were all in, um, we were all in the office together. And, and we missed that. We need that. And the company actually grows better when we're all together. So, um, so help us do that. So I think flexible options are, um, are, probably the way of the future. Mm -hmm. um, and, and although we've seen the demise of some or the, the shrinking of some of those options in the free market, um, I think landlords will begin to step up. They already are. Uh, will be stepping up to provide that. Yeah. 
I, it's it's the market. I mean, that's the the great thing about the free market, though. It's it's um, you know the the supply will follow demand, um, and there might be a slight disruption at the front end, but after a while, um, things will normalize, and and innovation will help speed that, and and hopefully make it more cost effective. The Use of outdoor space is interesting because it's, it's, you know, not everywhere, of course, is Southern California or, uh, you know, Palm Beach. Um, and as, as nice as it is to think about working outside today, it's, 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 you know, DC in winter, not exactly the best time to be at working outside. Um, you know, what, what are some of the creative ways that, you know, in your properties and, and, and working with, you know, designers and, 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 and engineers, have you found to address kind of that open space idea and climates that aren't exactly uh, 24 seven year round San Diego? <laughs> yeah. yeah, too bad for, for some of us, but um, really our focus is looking to grow to expand those shoulder months mm -hmm. so that in the fall and in the spring we can maybe open a little earlier in the spring and maybe stay open a bit later in the fall. And so looking at um, radiant heat nearby the building so that it's not an egregious use of energy and um, really just warming the personal space so that if you want to sit down and have dinner outside and it's maybe marginal, it will get you to a level of comfort. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's one idea. Um, we do see some protection here, here and there. Um, again, trying to um, sort of straddle the, the indoor outdoor feeling. Um, and some of those are really well done and, and some not so well done. So I think that that will become a focus. And of course, anything that expands commerce um, will catch on very quickly. So, so I think we can expect to see some real innovation in some of those um, little protective enclosures and semi-enclosures. Um, so I, I think it's about warmth and mm -hmm. really expanding really expanding that half a year to be more like three quarters. Yeah. I, I think COVID has, has shown how quickly, again, you know, um, service providers and, and, and businesses and, and buildings can, can act to keep their, their, their clients and customers happy. The number of restaurants, for example, that started serving dinners and pods outside um, with, you know, inside heaters is a good example of that. It, it, it's a quick, maybe not, you know, not permanent solution, but it's the kind of thing that they could do very easily, quickly. Um, it, it's easy to imagine that on a greater scale of providing, at least like you said, some radiant heat or something that, that will enable people to stay outside longer into October, or like you said, you know, starting to go outside in very early spring. Um, there was one point that was raised in an earlier roundtable, and this was early on in the pandemic when all bets were off and no one knew exactly what was going to happen next. But we had some designers who were talking about the future of buildings, and it was a roundtable called The Buildings We Work and We Live and Work In. And it was an interesting thing, and it caught in my mind because I'm just wondering how this would work. And I wanted to see if this was even something that you've even considered or something that's been talked about within. Uh, Brookfield, it's it's. We had one designer who was thinking, or not so much an engineer as he is a futurist. He's he's an engineer by trade, but he's pretty much makes his his stock and trade right now is looking to the future and and seeing what's next, of hybrid office buildings which also had residential space within them that would allow people to essentially live and work within a few floors of. Um, you know, their office. Is that something which has ever been been discussed or is that something which is still too too extraordinary? Well, you know, it's funny because I, I would say it's not extraordinary. And if you look over the past several years, the amenitization of multifamily properties, I know we have thousands and thousands of feet of amenity and a large portion of that in most buildings is um, 
is workspace. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's always been an option. I think it became a very relevant option this year. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was kind of the reverse of that concept. Um, I think that people that are interested in, in living very close to, to their workplace, um, may find that interesting. I think there are probably many other people that need even just a little distance yeah. um, so, <laughs> um, just from a mental health perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but, but I think it, in concept, it, it, it's not new. And certainly um, in the last decade, we've seen so many entrepreneurs and, and startups really working from home as as a beginning mm -hmm. and um and figuring out how to do that has um has been part of that equation and and landlords are looking to help that certainly um you know many of our properties some of our properties for instance in brooklyn uh we expect many of our our residents there are working there Mm -hmm. um, and not necessarily commuting to an office. And so um, to have conference rooms that you can arrange for and, and open workspace with strong Wi-Fi, um, all of those things are, are all available um, and, and should be, frankly. Yeah. So I, I, and I do have to ask the question because it's, it's you know, everybody considers the new normal, you know, the, you always see the competing articles in the paper about, you know, you have the, yes, this is the way it's going to be in the future. And no, we will revert back to 2019. Once we have enough vaccinations or we reach herd immunity, immunity. Uh, in your mind, do you think that, that the changes that are being undertaken in the marketplace right now are here to stay, that this is now the new um, threshold and it'll just kind of evolve over time? Or do you think that we will go back to our typical, you know, very high density traditional office space? Yeah, I, I think um, as with most things, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, I do think we'll be fairly high density relative to 10 years ago, relative to 15 years ago. But I do think that, um, again, everyone has experienced and understands that work from home can work. And I think it introduces a level of optionality for those who may be stressed to get into the office every day. So I think there may be, um, not maybe, I'm certain there, there will be more working from home. Um, but I also do believe that we will revert to to fairly high density mm -hmm. um, it, it's not difficult to be densely occupying a floor and still be six plus feet apart yeah, yeah. so um, I I think the vaccine vaccines will be a game changer uh, for real estate just like everything else um, and so a certain amount of normalcy will return with that um, but but will we feel the after effects and, and continue to lean into what we've learned through this. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's that combination. It's, 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 it's going to be a mix. And, and like you said, at the outset, it's really turning the office into um, an, an amenity, um, making it uh, uh, instead of feeling the, the compulsion to have to be in the office that you want to be in the office. Um, and that, goes beyond the the offerings that used to be the the big things the uh, you know the kitchenettes and the and the cold brew on tap more more of the um, offerings that you the, the way that you work within the office uh, seems to be the the what, what's going to change then yeah oh I think so and and I think um, basically everyone I've spoken to misses the camaraderie and misses the mm -hmm. human interaction part of being at work. Um, so uh, not too worried about about death of the office space, mm -hmm. personally. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, Sabrina, I really do appreciate your, your, your perspective on this. I think that it's a, it's a question that a lot of people in our industry are, are, are being forced to, uh, 
to, to work through with their clients in, in how, you know, buildings are either going to be retrofitted to, to meet the demands of now and then also what the next generation of buildings is going to look like. Um, and it's undeniable that Brookfield has put a lot of thought uh, and time into those considerations. So I appreciate your perspective today. Oh, well, thanks, Jeff. I've enjoyed our discussion. And again, um, I'm going to put the uh, link to the full roundtable in the show notes, uh, as well as the, uh, the link to uh, uh, Brookfield Properties. And um, really uh, would, would um, encourage everyone to look at not just the building density roundtable, but the previous roundtables that the Institute has done on the future of engineering really dealing with everything from density issues to the future of what the building's going to look like. And uh, very soon, um, our latest roundtable will be coming, which is going to be dealing with uh, really renewable energy and, and how buildings and how the built environment is going to address energy usage. So a great set of uh, informative, insightful content there. And uh, the ACEC Research Institute is uh, can be found at acecresearchinstitute.org. Uh, so again, Sabrina, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, this has been another episode of Engineering Influence, a podcast from the American Council of Engineering Companies. We'll see you next time. Build the tools for effective advocacy with ACEC's new online course, Effective Government Engagement at the Local, State, and Federal Levels. Learn from active practitioners in the fields of advocacy, communications, and lobbying on how you can create change and stand out in today's hectic policy environment. Register today for this five-session online course beginning March 2nd. Learn more by visiting our website at acec.org.